I'll feel free to be seated if your legs bother. So we're going 67 verses, unless, of course, I stop short. If you need to sit down, go ahead. Don't, don't worry about it, all right? Stand up on the inside, though. That's why we stand. It's just in honor of the word. You ready? Genesis chapter 24, verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord blessed Abraham in all things. How many things? All things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country, my family, and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to the land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? But Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, who spoke to me, swore to me, saying to your descendants, I give this land, and I will send, and he will send his, pardon me, there's no and there. You ready? Verse 7b. I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Verse 8. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you'll be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. So his servant put his hand under his thigh of the Abraham his master and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels. How many? Ten of his master's camels and departed, for all his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down Outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go to draw water. Then he said, O Lord God, my master Abraham, God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. Pardon me. And she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Let's stop there. Heavenly Father, Come speak to us. Amen. You may be seated. I've entitled tonight's message, He Meets Every Need. I want you to say that. He meets every need. Come on, say, God meets every need. Ready, set, go. God meets every need. I can't really hear you. Come on, those of you online, come on, lift your voice right in your own house or wherever you are. Ready? One, two, three. God meets every need. He meets every need. He does, and most people don't realize that, and honestly, it's taken me a good portion of my saved life to realize that, but I do realize it now. He meets every need, and some needs are greater than others. Now, I'm not talking about wants. You want a Maserati. A Maserati might not be a need. You need air. You need food. You need certain things, and some needs are greater than others. Matthew 6 and verse 8 says, For your Father knows everything that you have need of even before you ask. Is that crazy? He knows what we have need of before we can ever even think of it. It says in Matthew 6 and 32, For your Heavenly, Father's no, Heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first, come on, this ought to be committed to memory, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll add all these things to you. We heard that in about five different versions. <laughs> Goes on to say in verse 34, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry, for tomorrow will worry of its own thing. Sufficient for the day is the trouble thereof. In 1 Peter, I love this, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Philippians 4, verse 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So this, 
There's this picture of God who, who knows our needs, and if we trust him, he'll meet those needs. I'm telling you, God wants to meet every single need you have. And sometimes we think that God's some kind of loving slave owner or a child abuser or something. God hasn't held things back from you to cause you to be frustrated. God hasn't held things back from you to cause you to, to be neglected or rejected. He hasn't neglected you. He hasn't rejected you. He's accepted you. He died on a cross and rose again from the grave for you. He's made, he'll meet every human need, but it doesn't just do it all at one time. He's doing something in you. He's performing and perfecting everything concerning you. He's readying you for the, for the ruling and reigning. As we look at this text, Abraham has a great need. And it is a great need. It's not a desire. Well, it's a desire also. It's not just a want. It's not a Maserati. It's not a pie in the sky. It's a very real need. In fact, the need is so real for Abraham that everything hinges on his entire life and everything God's ever spoken to him hinges on this moment. Now that's pretty heavy. The great need, Sarah, is now dead. Isaac, the promised son, needs a wife. Because if Isaac doesn't have a family, there's not going to be more numerable than the stars. So he needs a wife, and a qualified wife at that. Isaac's son, pardon me, his son Isaac needs a wife, pardon me. I want you to turn to Genesis 18 and find this scripture, please. In Genesis 18, verse 19, put it up on the screen if you're able. Genesis 18, verse 19 is coming to be one of my favorite all-time scriptures. Now let me read this. For I have known him. Now this is, this is... The Lord speaking, kind of conversing, the angels and the Lord, there's three of them, come to visit. It's right before Sodom and Gomorrah become, you know, crispy critters. And so they're talking whether they should reveal to Abraham about what's about to happen. And, and here's what it says. For I have known him. Everybody say, I've known him. I have known him in order that he may commend his children. Stop. So the relationship that God has with Abraham is for a purpose. So, you, you, can you play Abraham tonight? Here, come on. All right. Come on. All right. You kind of look like Abraham a little bit. Okay. So, this text said, leave the text up. I'll tell you when to take it down, please. For I have known him. So, here's Abraham. So, God says, I've known him. I have a relationship with him. I've talked with him. I've led him. I've guided him. I brought him out of Ur the Chaldeans. I've known him for a purpose. And the purpose is that you would then command your children. What? Command your children and his household after him that they may keep the way of the Lord. So God has a relationship with Abraham for what purpose? To bring about a promise, but that promise is so big, so multi-generational that the, 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 the relationship that God has with Abraham is so that Abraham can Pour that into the next generation because there ain't no way it could happen in your lifetime. Amen. That's right. Thank you. Did you get that? Now that's heavy because that is the day and the hour that we're living in. I believe we're living in what I would call the synergy of the ages. I might not finish my notes. I, I've just been spending time with Jesus, praise God. Had a couple days off. I feel refreshed. Thank you, Lord. So I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Wow. So what, what did God speak to Abraham? All this land is yours, more numable when the, will your children be than the stars, more than the sand of the seashore. So I have a relationship with you, Abraham, I have a relationship with you, Joshua, says the Lord. Why? So that you can commend your children, teach them the way of the Lord, teach them righteousness and justice so that I can fulfill the promise I have for the earth and for you and your family. 
It's multi-generational. And I will tell you that most fathers, most mothers don't understand it, don't get it. And most kids don't either. And that's why they'll grumble or they'll murmur or they'll complain. Well, my friend doesn't have that standard. That's right. You're from a different breed. We're here to rule and reign. And it can be kind of frustrating when you're raising your kids in Sodom and Gomorrah High. They come back wondering why they can't do whatever. Simple. God has known me that I may commend you. And listen, it commands you. And it's, it, it's not a controlling anger helicopter. Don't do that. That's, you okay? God doesn't want you to be a helicopter. He wants you to teach them the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is not anger. The way of the Lord is, is pure and just, converting the soul, says Hassam 119. Amazing. So here Abraham is at the very last moments of his life. Sarah's gone, and he realizes that Isaac is the promised son, of course. God's miraculously saved him, tested Abraham greatly. And now Isaac needs a wife. And he, he tells uh, Eleazar, whose name, by the way, means a mighty divine helper. I'm sending you back to my, my, my country to get a wife. And he makes him swear an oath, which is kind of amazing. He has, Abraham has him put his servant's hand under his thigh, which is uh, symbolic of something else. And I'll let you study that on your own. It'd freak people out. So we'll just leave it at that. And he makes him swear, make an oath, make a vow, swear to me. And, and the Hebrew word there is fascinating. It's not just a regular oath or regular vow. It's, a, it's an oath or a vow that has a curse if you don't do it. Eleazar was his senior helper or servant, has been with him his whole life. And he makes a vow that he would go to Abraham's home country and get a wife for Isaac. And under no circumstances, I mean, uh, you know, Eleazar is like, yeah, well, what if they're not going to come with me? I mean, what, what if she doesn't want to come? I and mean, what if, you know, it was all these obstacles. How many of you know there's obstacles on the way to destiny? How many of you know that? Yeah, they're, they're, why, why is a Jordan flood stage when you have to cross it? Well, simple. So you can see the miracle power of God make you stronger and so that your enemies that you're about to fight just totally soil themselves when they see the Jordan <laughs> piled up by Adam. He says, under no circumstances you to take Isaac back to Ab Abraham's home country. And I think it's probably because Isaac might just want to stay and lose sight of the promised land. See, some of you have gone back to your home country over and over again. That's why you're not living in the promised land. So, some of you keep going back to the place that he brought you out of, and that's why you're not walking in freedom. You have to cut all ties with hell, ladies and gentlemen. Boys and girls, brothers and sisters, you got to cut all ties with hell. And if you don't cut them, you're going to end up living in Nahor. It doesn't even sound good. And Abraham encourages his servant by sharing with him that God will send his angel. Man, that's an intense verse. Yeah, don't worry, Eleazar, because the angel of God is going before you. Wow. You know, God could do that for you. In fact, let me say this. I, I, we have angels that go before us. So do you see them? I don't know, sometimes, rarely, sometimes. He said, well, how do you know? Well, it's not because my hair stands on end or I feel his wheel within a wheel and all of those things can be true. It's really because the Bible says so. It's not because I've got some, some crazy loon idea. Well, there's angels. No, there really is, though. See, you've had loon people, you know what I mean, kind of spiritual nuts and flakes. You guys don't know what I'm talking about? You've, you've had people that they really have no character, no integrity, but the angel of the Lord is leading them. Well, 
You know, maybe he's trying to get them sane and get them delivered. I would believe that. But the truth is, is that God does have angels and he, and he uses these ministers of flames of fire. He leads, he guides, he directs. I know for a fact we've been spared. I know for a fact I've been led. I know for a fact things like that have happened in my own life. Sometimes I see them, most of the times I don't. And he says to Abraham what I believe to be true for us also, that God will lead us, God will guide us, and he'll do it to meet every human need. What are you talking about? All right. I want you to think for a second. Now, Abraham's need is very real because everything, his whole life, hangs on Isaac getting the right wife. And if he doesn't get the right wife, then the Jewish race will not move forward and more numerable than the stars will not happen. And he thinks maybe, possibly, that he's going to die. If you read rabbinic scholars and commentaries. They think he's very possibly he's going to die while Eleazar, his mighty divine helper, is out going to get the, the wife. So he's making preparation because he's not sure. He's old now. Think about how God provided for you in the last... What, has anybody ever realized that God met your need? When he met your need, I want you to think about how that happened. How did it happen when God met your need? I'm going to tell you how it happened. He guided you. He guided you into his circumstances. He guided you into a relationship. He guided you to do something, to obey. He put you at the right place at the right time to meet somebody, to get the email, to answer the deal. He guided you. A supernatural guiding of the Lord took place. And that's what happens here. You see God sending an angel and Eleazar, a type of the Holy Spirit, goes back to, to the homeland, the home country, and it's, a, it's God just takes care of this whole thing. And Isaac gets a wife. See, God wants to meet every need. In fact, he meets every need if, if, if you let him guide you. If you don't let him guide you and you disobey, he ain't going to meet nothing. Unless, of course, in his grace and sovereignty, he does. He travels, Eleazar travels for 400 miles. It's about 400 miles. It takes him about a month. He prays, and it's interesting how he prays. He uses this word hesed in the Hebrew. It's, it means kindness, but it's so much more than that. You show kindness to Abraham. And, and he asks for this sign. He asks for a woman to come. He puts his fleece out, if we could say it that way. He asks for a confirmation and for God to bring this, this woman. And Rebecca comes and con with this confirming sign. And she waters his camels. By the way, a camels, ten of them, one Eleazar to ride on, nine loaded with gifts, nine gifts. We'll talk about that in a minute. Do you know how, many, how much water they would drink? Ten camels at a first drinking of water could drink approximately 140 gallons. Now, I know what it is to fill a five-gallon bucket full of water. Come on, we, we, we've done steams and had to carry water out there. Has anybody ever been in a steam bath? You carry water out there, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, five gallons, like, go get some more. I mean, right? So you mean you fill a tub, and maybe that's 25 or 30 gallons, and it's back and forth and back and forth. 140 gallons. you have any idea how much work that is? If, if 10 gallons would drink that much, and that's about how much they would drink if they were bone dry. 140 gallons, and this, this young girl does the whole deal. The servant gives gifts to Rebecca and, and finds out that, that she's Abraham's great niece. Now, we didn't read this, but you go read it later, all right? And he worships God for his intervention. He sees that God has absolutely intervened and provided the need. Indeed, the angel must have gone before him because it's totally miraculous. And Rebecca is then willing to go. And, and there's so much there, and I'm really skimming it over for the, the point that I sense the Holy Spirit wants to say tonight. There's so much here. You go back and read it, meditate it on it, make New Testament application, let it touch and change your life. She's willing to go, which is really amazing. It really is amazing. Like Abraham, she's willing to leave her home willing to leave everything she knows and go with Eleazar to this 400 miles away to marry. And she, she marries Isaac. 
You know, on your way to fulfilling destiny and purpose, you are going to face obstacles. And if you're, if you're deluded to think that you won't, then may the Lord heal your delusion right now. Because you're going to face mountains. You're going to have things coming at you like, like a Mack truck, like a Peterbilt with your name on the front. We come riding at you, and you're going to have to learn how to, you're going to have to learn how to, you know, get around it, get through it, or get over it. You're going to, you're going to have to learn how to overcome. Come on, he who overcomes. You get a new name and all kinds of great stuff in heaven. And he always reassures us. God is a reassuring God. Just as Abraham reassured his servant and said, the angel of the Lord's going before you, I want you to know this. I don't know what you're at in your life or what you're going through right now. I want to reassure you to tell you that the God of the universe who sent his only begotten son, and if you've believed on him in your heart and confessed with your mouth and you've made him your Lord and Savior, it's different to just believe on him. James says, I believe it's in James, even demons believe and they tremble. It's different to make him Lord and Savior. I mean, like really let him lead your life, obeying him. Live for him. That's very different. And if you learn to do that, no matter what obstacle you're facing right now, God will bring you everything you need. And if it seems like it's gone too far or, or, the, or the clock's been ticking and it hasn't happened yet, reassure yourself and know that God is God. Let his enemies be scattered, that he is the potter. You are the clay. And God will bring you through every obstacle, every challenge, every sickness, every disease. He'll bring you over into the land of milk and honey. If you You'll obey if you'll be led by him, if you'll be guided by him. And he, he'll confirm things over and over. I've shared this many times before. Oh, but I got saved before I was saved. I was married, have two kids. I don't see them yet, but I will one day. Maybe this is a year. And so I got saved after that. Got married when I was 21. Got saved after that. And in time, God healed me and did so much in my life. And I will never forget having an open vision as I'm walking across the parking lot after walking out of revival. I've been set free from having to have a relationship. I've been set free from having to have a wife. I got set free from all of that, and all I wanted was the Lord. And I realized, man, I, I, could, I could be like the Apostle Paul. I've been totally delivered. I mean totally delivered. And as I'm weeping, walking back to my car, like this encounter with the Lord, and he says to me, turn around and look at your bride. So I'm like, whoa. Oh, God, let her be pretty. Oh, God, oh, God. No. <laughs> And as I turn around, as I turn around, I have an open vision of Karen in a wedding gown. I mean, like clouds. She's walking to me on the clouds. She's coming, the fire, the glory of God. And as she comes closer and closer and closer, but just before she comes to me, the whole thing dissipates, and I'm staring at her face. And she's looking at me going, are you all right? And I said, uh, no. She said, all right, I'm going to pray for you. She walked off, and I went back to my car, went back to my car, and I said, oh, I don't want to mess this up. I don't know if that's you for sure. God, you're going to have to confirm it because I'm scared of making a mistake. I said, I don't, this is so good, you and me, you and me so good, and she's so fine, and my flesh and everything, God. Oh, you guys don't understand that. And I said, Lord, you've got to confirm it to me. And I'm going to tell you, God did incredible miracles in confirmation. And he will do that for you. He will, you, you ought to have the supernatural. I love what Mike Sisson said. Mike Sisson uh, helps our media, le leads our media along, Pastor Alex, and, and runs our whole youth ministry. And we so appreciate you, Mike. I love what Mike Sisson said in morning prayer this morning. You know, we have the supernatural so often that sometimes we forget to testify about it. I thought, isn't that the truth? You see, it is a normal thing for God to come and visit you, speak to you, talk to you, show you stuff. 
I had, I had owls. I had owls come and confirm that she was my wife. And most of you heard many of these testimonies, but I don't think many of you haven't heard this one. I'm running up a hill. I used to be like really ripped in good shape way back then. In my mind. <laughs> I'm running up a hill. And I'm right to the, just the grind. You know, it's a, it's a good mile climb. I'm giving it everything I have. And in the, in the middle of the day, a, puehu, a, a, a Hawaiian owl flies right straight across my face. I mean, I could almost feel the wind. I mean, very close. Runs right, flies right across, lands on a tree at the other side of the street. While that happened, the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit falls on me. I've been like, whoa. And I'm looking, and the owl's looking at me. The owl's looking at me, and I have this question in my spirit. Lord, is she really my wife? Is she really to be my wife? That's the next thing. It's right out of my spirit. It's not a thought process. Now, you got to know this. My wife loves raptors, owls, anything that has claws and kills stuff. She likes that. <laughs> she likes raptors, birds. Not so much chickens, but birds. So the owl flies across, power of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about God confirming things to you and meeting your need. Owl looking at me, out of my spirit is, is she really my wife? And the owl just goes. I'm like, whoa. And it just goes. And takes off and leaves me with every hair standing there like, whoa, yeah. Come on, Jesus. I just, I worked that hill, man. Broke every record right all the way to the top. Listen, God will, he will confirm his will for you. Now, listen, it's right here in black and white and some of it in red. And hopefully you got some other colors in there from you underlining stuff. It's right here. You know what God's will is based on his word. His will is not outside of his word. But there's certain things outside the principles, outside the principles of the word where you're going to have to be led by the Spirit. You're going to have to choose. And when you do that, you can be led by God. And in doing, being led by Him, He will meet your need. And God met my need and my wife in a way that I didn't even know I had. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for my wife. I wouldn't be in ministry if it wasn't for my wife. I can't really talk about it too much. i got to move on. Praise God. <clears throat> Praise God. The key to your guidance. Now, remember... He will meet every need, but he meets every need as he guides you. He guides you. He guides you to Walmart to fill out the application so you can get a job, so you can have provision, so that you can tithe, so you can meet somebody at Walmart, so we can open up another door, so you can get another job, and then maybe another one. And then he, he guides you like that, but if you never get off your duff and get down to Walmart, you ain't ever going to have the job. And he, how can he lead you if you don't do it? All right, that was for someone. The key to our guidance, the key to God meeting every need is to keep praying. Eliezer prayed, and it's a beautiful prayer. Isaiah chapter 65, 21, it says, Before they call, I will answer. I love that verse. Before they call, I'll answer. And always keep in mind that God desires to bless you. And that he will fulfill his promises. God will fulfill your, his promises towards you. I love verse 1 of Genesis. Come on, turn there with me. Genesis 24, verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. How many things? All things. But he still needed a wife for his son. I feel like that. I don't feel old like Abraham. I feel like I'm 25, maybe 28. Until I start running, then I feel a little bit older. I feel like that. I, I, I feel like that, that, that if God never did another thing for me, he's already done it. And yet before us is this, this building that we need to build. And I'm going to tell you this, it will be built and there will be other mountains that we will climb. It's not the last building we'll be. It's not the build. It's not the last thing that we will do. We will continue to reach. We'll continue to launch out into the deep. We'll continue to throw our nets. You never arrive. You know that, right? Vision is progressive. Everybody say that. Vision is progressive. So whatever vision you have for your life, for your business, for your family, it grows. 
That's just the nature of how God does things. He speaks, he acts, he speaks again. Take it from Genesis all the way to Revelation. That's what he does. He speaks, he acts, he speaks again. And he uses you and he uses me. Amazing. He partners with us. And then he rewards us. He rewards us for it. My, my, my. So keep in mind that God desires to bless you and that he will fulfill his promises. You know, I, I came here to Alaska with my beautiful family going on 11 years now. And I'm going to tell you why we came here. I didn't come here because Dr. Morocco called me up and said, hey, would you go to Alaska? I didn't come here because somebody had a little idea that I should just move here. God spoke to me and my wife so clearly that it's unmistakable. I mean, you would need that to leave the island of Kauai. One of the most beautiful places in the world, and yet I wouldn't live there for anything now because I'm in the perfect will of God. I was in the perfect will of God there. I'm in the perfect will of God here. And I'm, I'm you know, we're looking, for, we're, we're looking for grave plots. In other words, we ain't going nowhere. We're going to see a great revival. And I have a promise. I have a promise from God. And he's, he's led us and guided us. Listen, it's the same for you. You've got to take steps of faith. You've got to do your part. You know, it was a little scary on that first night in January as my whole family's here and our, our stuff is on, a, on the water. It was a little terrifying as my whole family passed out. Hannah was about like this tall. Danny was four. Hannah was seven. And we get everybody in that little apartment on Roy Street, right over here. Everybody's sleeping, and I went outside in a pair of surf shorts and slippers. You know what those are? Flip-flops here in Alaska. And I went outside, I think it was 10 below zero, and it was a snowstorm. And I just lifted my hands, and I said, oh, God, I'm here. Just, just want to sense what you're doing in the spirit. Lord, let me sense the spiritual atmosphere. And I was like, Lord. And all I could hear is, you're an idiot. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, you're an idiot. Really loud, really strong, like three times. By the third time, I had to preach myself out of a hole. You're an idiot. You left Kauai. That place is in revival. You come to this dead place. Frozen, the frozen chosen. That's where you came. Everybody hates you here. You should go home. Why don't you quit? Oh, yeah. Listen, you start doing things that God leads you supernaturally. The enemy will come and whisper the exact opposite because he's nervous. I said the devil's nervous about what you're going to do. History books are waiting to be written about your life. If you'll just agree, if you'll just believe, if you'll just take steps of faith. Come on, you've got to be like Eleazar. Just get out of the boat and get going. Get looking. Come on, believe for the breakthrough. Believe that it'll meet every need. But if, if you don't get moving, if you don't launch a rocket, it's hard to direct it. Everything that we have in this church, and I could go back from Dr. Morocco who taught us, taught us all of that, who was taught to him by his parents, who was taught to his parents by the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and other men of God, women of God. This is kingdom living. If you have it in your pocket, does that mean it's a, it's a confirmation? Well, maybe, but maybe not. We never had one nickel to do anything that we've done. And now we own a property that was just reappraised unofficially for $10 million. But we just bought it for a million. So within the span of about six months, God gave us $9 million. Oh, you're not nearly as excited as I am. I'm pretty excited about that. That's like awesome. Furthermore, we owned it decades ago, sold it for $3.5 million, used that, bought a whole shopping center, and then God gives it back to us? At heaven's prices? You want to tell me who could do that? Nobody but God. And he'll do the same thing in your life. He's done the same thing in my personal life. And he'll do it for you. God will meet every need of yours. But he does it by guiding you. He guides you. He leads you. Hallelujah. Now let me show this to you and we'll be done. Maybe. This whole, this whole thing is an incredible type and shadow of the Holy Spirit. It's the last point here in the notes. Directing us to the Lord and meeting our greatest need. So what do you mean by that? 
Well, you'll see that Eleazar, and again, his name means mighty divine helper. That's what his name means. And he comes with 10 camels. I'd like to think he's on one, and nine are loaded with gifts. How many gifts of the Spirit are there? There's nine. And comes to get Rebecca, which is a type and shadow of the, um, of the church. See, we're the bride of Christ, right? And, and in previous messages, you can get it online. I don't have time to do it now. But Isaac, Isaac is a type of Christ or, or God. And we've shown that over and over. Just to, just to go back to one of the last messages we preached about how Isaac was brought up the mountain at 37 years old. Some say I think he was 33. Up the mountain to be sacrificed in Mount Moriah, the very same place that Jesus was sacrificed. And if you didn't hear that message called Pass the Test, it's available online. And we, sh we showed how Isaac was really like a type of Christ. So Eleazar, the Holy Spirit, comes, gets the bride, brings her to Isaac, and they get married. It's a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a picture of the greatest need you have. You need a Savior. Can somebody say amen? amen. Worship team, uh, just minister Micah, please. The Lord is going to meet every need that you have. Don't you be discouraged tonight. Be encouraged. God of all creation who made you, knit you together while you were in your mother's womb will meet every single need you have. But you're going to have to do your part. you got to get, get going. Get going. I'm glad for those sovereign moments of when the Lord just shows up and blesses me. Who doesn't like that? Isn't that awesome? But I will tell you, most of the miracle breakthroughs of provision, healing, deliverance, salvation, all of that kind of stuff, most of that has come when I stepped out and acted on something that I felt like he spoke to me, when I began to move. Many years ago, we were picking up a guest speaker in the, in the airport, and that's when there was pre-TSA. And we went in and we're waiting and the plane's delayed and there's like 300 people in a waiting area. And so we just sat off to the side, a bunch of young adults, and we're sitting there and the Lord speaks to me so clear and says, how many of you, those, how many of you think of those people are saved? And so I'm like, I don't know, maybe 20, 10? And it just sits with me. And the Lord's like, I, I want you to share the gospel with them. I'm like, oh, no, get somebody else. Praise God. No, no. <laughs> no. That's not God. Praise God. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so I'm sitting there struggling with it, struggling. Look, I would look, and then I start having discernment. I start seeing a married couple that their marriage is on the rocks, and I see the kids are all fornicating. I see that. I, I see another couple struggling with identity and, and all that. I see, I see people stuck on drugs. I begin to see what's happening. And that's bothering me. And I'm just like, ah. Oh. And then I made a mistake, which is actually not a mistake. It's what you should do. But I, I said to one of my rough and tough buddies that was there, I said, man, you know what just happened to me? He's like, what? I said, how many, the Lord says, how many people you think are saved? So I sort of bring everybody into my experience. And after I tell the guy the whole story, he's just like, he just starts praying in tongues. I'm like, oh, come on, come on. Because I didn't want to be embarrassed. I didn't want to be rejected. I, I didn't want to be the guy out there doing the thing. I'm so troubled. And then the Lord says this to me, which has happened a few times. If the watchman who's on the wall sees the army coming and doesn't blow the trumpet, then the blood is on his hands. And at that, I was just like, oh, Jesus. And I walked away. I walked away. My friends praying in tongues. People are praying in tongues. I walk away. And I'm like, Lord, just come upon me with an anointing. I know what that's like. Hit me with fire and I'll do it. Nothing. Absent. The opposite of that. I just feel cold and dead. Lord, just come upon me. Raha. Give me fire and I'll do it. Nothing. And so I look over and I see a payphone. That's when they used to have payphones. I look over, I see a payphone. I see somebody leaning against the payphone right at this place where I would, if I, would, if I was going to do it, I would stand where he's standing. So I'm like, oh, that's a perfect place, but he's dead. And the guy just moves. Like, 
God. So I go over there and I, I stand there. I'm like, Lord, I'm going to do it. 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 I'm going to like, I'm just like ready to jump off a cliff. But I, I'm, I'm terrified. And I know what I'm going to say and all that. I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. I said, Lord, I just need one more piece of encouragement. God, just one. And I open my eyes and I look on the far side and in walks Mr. Shondai my friend he comes in praying in tongues just just taking authority I mean like like fire on the other side of the that's my encouragement ah! ladies and gentlemen I jumped out and said oh hi have you had a wonderful time in Hawaii and they're looking at me I said have you had a wonderful time in Hawaii and they're like yes I said oh good I want to tell you a joke and so I said just please listen so you'll enjoy it I said, a man was riding his bike. He got hit by a bus, and he went to heaven. He was standing outside the gates, and Peter says to him, just tell us God's name, and you can come on in. And the man who got killed said, that's easy. God's name's Howard. And the angel says, what? Or Peter, or whatever I said. What's his name? Howard. Everybody knows that. God's name's Howard. He says, how did you come up with that? Easy. Our Father who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. The place roared. They roared. There's people laughing so hard. And then I said, seriously, if your plane crashes tonight, it wasn't so funny at that point. Will you go to heaven? And I've preached the gospel with my hair on fire, trembling under this powerful anointing. And I had pretty much the same thing that happens in church. You have some people that aren't listening. You have people that are like, hate you and want you to shut up right now. You know, when you preach something that's convicting, they're like, shut up. They could just see you see in their face. Shut up. So I see that. And then I see whole groups of people just being impacted. Some of them crying. And I said, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, won't you do it now? And since we're at the end of the service and the story is anointed and I can feel it right now, why don't you ask yourself that question? Why don't you ask yourself this question? If you die tonight, if tonight is your last night, your very last night, and you die, will you go to heaven? So I'm going to church. That ain't enough. Church going doesn't get you to heaven any more than surrendering your body to the flames. Come on, you online, listen up. If you die tonight, will you go to heaven? I hope so. That's not good enough. You can know. We've written these things, says the gospel. We've written these things that you may know. Jesus Christ was crucified, died on a cross, rose again from the grave. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. So have you, have you repented? Have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth? If you've never done that, don't leave. Don't leave tonight. Don't turn off the computer. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, this is your moment that you might not ever get again. He said, well, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Yeah, help the enemy makes sure you're never ready. If you want to get right with God, every, every eye closed, every head bowed, just like I did in that, in that airport dozens of years ago. If you die tonight, are you going? Quit playing religious games. Stop it. He wants to guide you. He wants to help you. He wants to meet every need. And the greatest need you have is salvation. That's the greatest need. The greatest need is that you would repent and come and be born again. You must be born again. Can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus said to Nicodemus, you, you don't even know these things. You must be born again. Your spirit your life is separated from God because of sin. There's nothing that can make that right except the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and believing on Him and your repentance, your partnering in it. This type and shadow of Eleazar, the mighty divine helper, the Holy Spirit, the Paracletos, the standby, the third part of the Trinity. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is reaching out across this place, across the internet, to touch your heart, 
to bring you to a place of brokenness, to a place of repentance, so he can bring you to Isaac, bring you to Jesus, so that you can be saved. Because that is the biggest need that you have. And by the way, the promise of God and the, and the plan and the future that even your ancestors prayed for will not come about if you don't get right with God. Not, not, not for you and your part of it. 